Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome um, to the third Sunday after Epiphany, and um, we have a couple of announcements. So, first announcement is prayers to the family of Willard Kiefer. He passed away yesterday. Um, services are being planned, and we will let you know further details as soon as we have them. Does anyone else have any other announcements? Okay, not seeing any, um, we will get started with the brief order of Confession and Forgiveness on page 77 in your green hymnal. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The gathering here today is number 718 in your blue hymnal. Page 77. Oops, 
78. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of his Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being of the Church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia.
reading is from 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 12 to 13. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even though, even so the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now if you are the body of Christ, and each of you is a part of it, and that God has placed in the church first of all, of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work all? Do all work miracles? Do they? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak tongue in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gift. And yet I will show you the most excellent way. Your end is in sight. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. <laughs> spread throughout the, all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recover his sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Here ends the reading of the gospel. If I can have the children come forward.
Okay, so you have to have good sauce. Okay, so let's say you have good sauce, but you um, burn the spaghetti. Do you have good spaghetti? No. No. You're making mac and cheese, and Dad accidentally puts in too much milk and makes it super runny. <laughs> Which has happened before. <laughs> Is it good? Yeah. It's still good because you like running mac and cheese. But if you were Reagan, Reagan doesn't like running mac and cheese, so Reagan would think it's not very good. All right, cilantro lime chicken. What's the most important step in cilantro lime chicken? <laughs> you eat it, right? <laughs> so, when you listen to the verses this morning, especially the ones in Corinthians, it talked about all the parts of your body. And it said basically that your feet and your hands are there to do the hard work. And often we as humans tend to neglect them. And we abuse our hands and our feet through hard work, through putting on lots and lots of miles, and one of the things that it tells you to do in the Bible verse today is to make sure that you understand that you take care of all of the parts of your body. So if you are an athlete, it's important to have good nutrition, good, get lots of rest, um, hopefully block on a punt. <laughs> um, but it's important for you to understand that your body is all connected. If you don't take care of everything on the inside, through coming to church, through the faith, you have a hard time understanding how you are supposed to live. And coming to church gives you that guide and that roadmap for your future. Okay? Thank you. First, I have to thank Riley for reading that verse with all those names I gave to her on purpose. <laughs> so, so I didn't have to do it. <laughs> so I printed off these verses. Um, and I printed them off about two weeks ago. And I started to read them and I read them multiple times. And not being a biblical expert, I was like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. Um, and so I did what most high school students do. I turned to the internet. <laughs> and I actually found a couple of pieces that I thought were pretty valuable um, that explained it, I think, much better than I could. So, and I'm going to start with the, the chapter on Corinthians. So... The second part of Corinthians 12 echoes many of the themes from last week's text that was in the beginning of 1 Corinthians. The themes include diverse giftings of the Spirit, the necessity of all spiritual gifts, the revitalization of the gift of tongues, and the celebration of the diversity of spiritual gifts. So, the bulk of this passage is devoted to Paul's development of a body as a metaphor to illustrate the proper relationships among members of the Corinthian congregation. However, Paul sets the stage for this metaphor by calling to mind the elements of the Corinthians ritual and liturgical, liturgical life together. In chapter 12, verse 13, he reminds the Corinthians that they have all been baptized into one body and made to drink of one spirit. While it should not be pressed too far, it may be that this reference to drink is a subtle allusion to the practice of the Lord's Supper, a practice that Paul just finished discussing in 1 Corinthians 11. In that context, Paul urged his audience to discern the body when partaking of the Lord's Supper. Although Paul may have intended the body of Christ himself in that context, the repetition of body imagery here in chapter 12 makes the reference in chapter 11 at least somewhat ambiguous. From verse 14 on, Paul develops a detailed metaphor of the human body to explain the relationship among members of the body of Christ. Despite the metaphorical language that he uses, Paul's meaning is clear. All members of the Corinthian congregation are equally necessary for the full flourishing of the body. This means that highlighting certain members to the detriment of others is problematic to the whole body. While the issue in chapter 12 has to do with the privileging 
of members with certain spiritual giftings, the discussion of the Lord's Supper in chapter 11 of the Corinthians' eagerness to forgive a man's involved in a scandalous relationship in chapter 5. She has said Paul is concerned with any issue that might elevate some members of the congregation over others. This is a helpful point to remember for our own time, when debates over spiritual gifts may be less fraught than debates about other markers or divisions or identities along social, economic, racial, gender, or political lines. And when I think about that, I think about our current transition. Without a pastor, without a um, current lead, we are in a congregation that's currently in change. And change is scary. Change is something that um, most of us don't relish. Change is something that um, can cause fraction, can cause division, can cause others to point fingers. Well, they're doing this. They're doing that. Who's in charge? All of those things can be part of that discussion. And what I think this verse reminds me of, at least, is that we, all of us here today, are a family. And that as a family, it's our mission, not individually, but as a whole, to collectively move forward and to find our new path. And I think that that's something that um, is going to be a process. I think it's going to be a struggle. But I think that's something that um, is an Important for us to understand that we have to do this together if we want to remain this body of this family that's something that we have to do we can't neglect one piece well we gotta have a pastor immediately okay but what about the process of finding the right one and so that to me is what this verse said to me now if I go to the Luke chapter and again because I read it, and I was like, okay, what, is, what does this mean? What is this talking about? Jesus went back to Nazareth. Well, I know that that means he went back to his homeland, but beyond that, what does that really mean? So, again, from the internet. Our passage opens with Jesus returning to the power of the Spirit to Galilee from the wilderness, where he had overcome temptation. When he returns, a report is heard about him, throughout the region, and he travels around teaching in the synagogue. Jesus' work is accompanied by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Luke leads, fills, and empowers for prophetic work. Such, such characters as Zechariah, his wife Elizabeth, Simeon, and John experience the Spirit and proclaim through the filling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself is filled with the Holy Spirit, who then leads him into the wilderness for a time of fasting and testing. So when Jesus being led by the Spirit, we should not be surprised to encounter guidance, empowerment, and prophetic words. Luke 4, 16 through 17. In his travels around Galilee, Jesus finally comes to his hometown of Nazareth. It is described as a place he was brought up. It is a place where he was provided food, nourishment, that allows growing and flourishing. When it is the Sabbath, Jesus does what he usually does. He goes to the synagogue. When he is there, he stands up to read, which is the normal practice for reading scripture in the synagogue. And he is handed the scroll of Isaiah. He opens it and chooses the place he wants to read them, or read from. We see the customs and habits of Jesus. He is one who regularly participates in the religious life of his community. He is a reader who contributes to the reading of scripture in worship, and he is a teacher. Craig Keener writes, Nazareth was an agricultural village that sat on a major trade route and was close to the Galilean capital of Sephoris, which was being rebuilt during the time Jesus was growing up. Most likely, those who knew Jesus from his time growing up in the town were not surprised by his ability to read Hebrew. Luke 4, 18-19, Jesus chooses to read from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1-2. through 2. Here it is helpful to focus on both the actual quotation from Isaiah and the surrounding context in which Isaiah quotation is found. Jesus reads a quotation that refers to the Spirit of God, the same Spirit who brought him to Nazareth. We know that the Holy Spirit in, God, in Luke guides and empowers people from prophetic ministry. In this quotation, the Spirit of the Lord is resting on the speaker for the purpose of proclaiming good news to the poor, to those who are economically disadvantaged and marginalized, along with the poor as a broad group. Good news is also proclaimed to specific groups of people, prisoners, the blind, and the oppressed all of whom might also be described as poor. 
What is the good news? Is it news that this is the year of God's favor? The year of God's favor describes the jubilee year when God will restore Israel. So when I read this piece, I immediately thought of um, something that we had just covered in my social studies class. And what we covered in my social studies class happened to be um, rather fitting because Monday was Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And so what we talked about was in August of 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested and put in jail in Birmingham, Alabama. And he was put in jail essentially for a violation of a local ordinance that didn't allow um, him to have a march or protest without a proper permit. Um, they had established a rule because there had been protests in Birmingham, Alabama for the Civil Rights Movement, and they basically said that they were trying to ban the gatherings, and so they made a rule that you had to have a permit. And Martin Luther King Jr. knew that the permit would take too long to get, that it wouldn't help them, that they would get buried in a bureaucratic nightmare, and so he decided that he was going to violate that. So he ends up being arrested and thrown in jail for violating this order. And while he was in jail, he writes a fairly famous historical document called The Letter from a Birmingham Jail. And I'm going to read part of that, but what I'm going to read first is actually a public statement that was issued by eight Alabama clergymen before that. So this is from April 12th of 1963, which happened to be Good Friday. We, the undersigned clergymen, are among those who in January issued appeal for law and order and common sense in dealing with racial problems in Alabama. We express understanding that honest convictions in racial matters could probably be pursued in the courts, but urge that decisions on those courts should be in the meantime peacefully evaded. Since that time, there have been some evidence of increased forbearance and a willingness to face facts. Responsible citizens have undertaken to work on various problems which cause racial, racial friction and unrest. In Birmingham, recent public events have given indication that we all have opportunity for a new constructive and realistic approach to racial problems. However, we are now confronted by a series of demonstrations by some of our Negro citizens directed and led in part by outsiders. We recognize the natural impatience of people who feel that their hopes are slow in being realized. But we are convinced that these demonstrations are unwise and untimely. We agree rather with certain local Negro leadership, which has called for honest and open negotiations of racial issues in our area. And we believe that it's kind of facing the issues can be best accomplished by citizens in our own metropolitan area, white and Negro, meeting with their knowledge and experience of the local situation. All of us need to face the responsibility and find proper channels for its accomplishment. Just as we formally pointed out that hatred and violence have no sanction in our religious and political traditions, we also point out that such actions as incite to hatred and violence, however technically peaceful among those actions may be, have not contributed to the resolution of our local problem. We do not believe that these days of new hope are days when extreme measures are justified in Birmingham. We commend the community as a whole and the local news media and law enforcement in particular on the calm manner in which these demonstrations have been handled. We urge the public continue to show restraint should the demonstrations continue and the law enforcement officials to remain calm and continue to protect our city from violence. We further strongly urge our own Negro community to withdraw support from these demonstrations and to unite locally and working peacefully for a better Birmingham. When the rights are consistently denied, a cause should be pressed to the courts in negotiations among local leaders and not in the streets. We appeal to both our white and Negro citizenry to observe the principles of law and order uh, and common sense. And this was signed by eight members of the clergy. So um, one was an Episcopal bishop, another was a Roman Catholic bishop, um, one was a rabbi, so he was a, a, a Jewish rabbi. Um, there was a couple that were Methodist, um, another Episcopalian, um, a Presbyterian, and a member of a Baptist church. And they wrote that letter and it was published in the newspapers. And so I'm gonna read you just a couple of the verses from Martin Luther King Jr. So while confined here, 
And this is his response when he was jailed in August. While confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling our present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom if ever do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all of the criticism that crossed my desk, my secretaries would be engaged in little else during the course of the day, and I would have no time for constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I would like to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. I think I should give the reason for my being in Birmingham. Since you have been influenced by the argument of outsiders coming in, I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization operating in every southern state, with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. We have some 85 affiliate organizations all across the South, one being the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Whenever necessary and possible, we share staff, educational and financial resources with our affiliates. Several months ago, our local affiliate here in Birmingham invited us to come or on call to engage in a nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. We readily consented, and when the hour came, we lived up to our promise. So I am here along with several members of my staff because we were invited here. I'm here because I have the basic organizational ties here. Beyond this, I'm in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the 8th century prophets left their little villages and carried their thus saith the Lord far beyond the boundaries of their hometown, and just as the Apostle Paul left his little village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to practically every hamlet city of the Greco-Roman world, I too am compelled to carry the gospel of freedom Beyond my particular hometown, like Paul, I'm constantly I constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. So when we discussed this in class, I was a little bit nervous, to be honest with you, because I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to get. And I was blown away by our young people and their thoughtfulness. Um, we delve into this, and, and again, I try not to steer away from um, touchy subjects because I think that touchy subjects, things like um, race, things like um, almost anything that's in the news today are things that help us learn and grow. And so for me, I embrace sort of the idea of touching on maybe what we would call touchy subjects. And race is something that I think for most of us, I mean, if we look around, we are in a very lily white area. And so for us, race is something that I think, because of some of my background having spent over 10 years in Phoenix and working with a number of different people of um, different minorities, I have maybe just a little bit more experience than a lot of our local students. And so I think it's important for us to understand the differences. And so when I talked to this about class, I was blown away by some of the responses. And one of the responses, because I said, well, what's, what's Martin Luther King Jr. saying? And, he's, and one of the responses was that basically he's throwing, the, th he's throwing the Bible back in the face of the clergy. And if you read on, you'll, you'll basically get that, that he's very extremely um, polite, He's being extremely um, thoughtful in his word choice, but he's essentially throwing the Bible back in the face of the clergymen that are saying, we need to be careful here. We can't have these riots. These are bad for, the, the, these are bad for Birmingham. This is, these don't belong here. And what Martin Luther King Jr. says, I was invited here. I am taking up the mantle of someone like Paul who went from town to town professing the good news to try to help people that are not being treated equally and fairly. And so when you look at the Luke today, Luke mentions that there's a strong tie between, and basically it says that Luke or that Jesus is talking to the lowest of the group. So he's talking to the poor, he's talking to those that are um, Blind that are oppressed that don't that aren't the hierarchy of the church. He's talking to those that are the underlings. And 
I thought they went sort of hand in hand because I think that often we look at what we all bring to the table. And and I I look at it and you can, I mean you could relate the Packer game to this because the Packer game, the special teams, okay? Everybody that watched the game knows that the special teams is one of the biggest reasons why the Packers lost the game. And are those special teams players your stars? No, those special teams players are guys that are on minimum contracts, typically that are trying to make a play, they're trying to make a team. Those are on a professional football team. Those, those gunners, those guys that are trying to do the blocking, those are the guys that are the 53rd, 54th, 52nd, whatever number of man on the roster. There's 87 million guys that are trying to fill that spot. And when we look at them, it's easy for us to say, blame those guys. And as a coach, it's my natural reaction to blame the coach because the, the piece was he didn't prepare his guys to do the job the way they were supposed to. Now, some of it's on the players for lack of execution. And when you look at this, again, I think it's important to understand what Jesus is trying to say is that we are all in this together. There's nobody higher or lower than anybody in this church. There's nobody, and again, he's speaking to below because he's trying to bring value to those that have less, those that aren't included and in part of the key piece of what he's talking about. And so Jesus is really trying to lift up those that are on the bottom side. And I think, again, that's what Martin Luther King Jr. was doing. That's what I think as a society we often sometimes lack. And I think we do a pretty good job. We do our thing with um, the red buckets in the back where we try to make a play every, every month for someone. And, and those are important pieces. And I think that that's what Jesus is asking us as a congregation to do. And hopefully the Packers can find a um, better answer at special teams. So. <laughs> um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The hymn of the day is number 781 in your um, blue book. Creed, found on page 84. 
85, sorry. <clears throat> I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Let us pray for the family of Willard Keeper and all those experienced the loss of loved ones. Let us pray for those that are experiencing illness or sickness during this time. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Let us pray for our military who help defend and protect and whose sacrifice to country cannot be forgotten. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Let us pray for Trinity Lutheran Church as we progress through our own time of change and look to a new chapter. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lastly, let us pray for our young people who live in a world that can be tough to navigate, help guide them to make good choices and do the best to honor you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. In your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all who we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus, our, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our sending hymn is with one voice, the blue book, number 771.